Hey everyone. So uh, here's the thing. Uh, we had an interesting series of discussions and, and kerfluffles on our Discord server, and we wanted to talk about them for a moment. And I want to do it in a way where we weren't going to sort of kind of target the people in question because it's not really appropriate, but rather to discuss sort of this reoccurring trend we keep seeing as, as a tension within the online left. Mm -hmm. um, here's how it works. In all of these situations, what we tend to find is there are individuals who want to have a very clear, objective idea of what is good and evil, what is good and bad. Well, and, and how we judge people, right? And how we judge people. It tends to be a very moralist perspective that tends to, in my opinion, be very reductionist and cause issues in discussions, especially very complex discussions, right? On the other side of this, you tend to have a lot of people who are very sort of pluralist or postmodernist who want to say that, like, there's nothing inherently good or bad. It's just what are the outcomes or what, um, you know, what what are the things that are actually happening in these situations? And I generally tend to be more compassionate towards that second view, though it can go too far. In some cases, it can be used to either justify genuinely harmful things because it tries to flatland everything into sort of being perspectives that are nested in their own culture or their own situation mm -hmm. um, when things just genuinely do harm, right? Like, that that's an actual thing. This kind of gets a little bit to the offense versus harm stuff, but more so kind of gets into this idea of like what defines a good or a bad person and how do we use these terms? There's this thing that's been going around on, on you know, Twitter and a few other places for a long time. And it's this, you know, picture of the, the dude from American Psycho. And it says, you know, how I sleep knowing that my enemies are ontologically evil and anything I do to them is justified. And I've talked about before on the stream why that concept bothers me. The short version is, is that I think it gives them a scapegoat because we're assuming that at an ontological level, these people are evil. And by definition, they could do no other. I think that actually reduces or removes their responsibility. I am firmly against the concept of determinism. Yes, absolutely. And by the way, Jess and I are very much of the same opinion on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Just only one of us can talk at a time. So yeah, keep that in mind. So, and Zena and I have talked about this pretty ad nauseum, so uh, yeah. So the thing is, is that the reason I dislike determinism is because the, the notion as a philosophy is that, basically, long story short, is that it takes away free will. I believe human beings have free will, or at least the illusion of it. And I think it's important to hold on to that illusion because it's pretty important for us to have the ability to make choices. If people's choices didn't matter, that is, their choices could only by, be looked at as a programmed response, that is, they were always going to do this regardless, our ways of thinking about morals, laws, punishments, all of these things would go out the window because people could do no other than they did. We'd essentially be punishing them for no reason because the assumption of law is that you knew the law and you chose to break it. So the problem is that, uh, what Fetch say, I don't think those people who are sharing it are doing so, are, that are doing it are, 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 are doing it ironically. I don't believe it either, but I certainly have posted it in response to someone being an asshole. And that's fine. Fair. Sometimes you gotta, sometimes you gotta, pull out the big guns. I'm fine with that. I have literally a picture of the girl from Blend Us that says Shinde Kudasai, which means please die. Um, so like, I get it. But the thing that I'm trying to get to is this, is, and I don't want to rehash that meme, but more so this idea that like, what defines a good or bad person? How do we look at this? Because people are rarely all good or all bad. They're often we base these assumptions and these things on very essential takes based on snapshots of the person. Someone acts out towards us online. We assume they're an asshole. They must be bad in all ways. When in reality, there's probably a much more complicated thing. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't block them or ignore them or make them go away. But people exist in multitudes. It's little a uh, little Miss Pandagal said. So mm -hmm. one of the things I want to make really clear is that when we're looking at this, we have to look at it through a couple lenses. One of them is the developmental lens. And one of them is also the question around you know, what philosophies are we choosing a axiomatically to come from? I am very anti-determinist. I think free will is important because otherwise we can't hold people accountable. So coming from that place, then it comes down to, well, what, pe what are people aware of, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is why I think that this is something to go into. So I want to kind of give a brief overview on this before we kind of get into some of our thoughts. Yeah, um, as far as... Go ahead. As far as the developmental lens, I think that's especially important as a leftist to have some understanding here. Because when we see people acting a certain way, this is often the tool that we need to evaluate here of, okay, what? how do I approach this person? How do I tackle this topic? How do I 
how do I deal with it? Right. And if you're not aware of, of how people learn, okay, or what is involved in that learning process to get to that take, you're not really going to be able to reach the person in any meaningful way. There's a reason that Jess's or Poppy's done and shared a lot of the integral and Zen training and all of that and shared that with me and also the channel because those are the fundamental building blocks that are what helped Poppy get to the takes that we are here on the channel showing you now. And without that, we wouldn't really be able to do what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. So looking at this from a developmental perspective, this is what I want to make very clear. Immediately, most leftists are going to be uncomfortable discussing development. And the reason for that is, is that it is a hierarchy. There is lesser, le lesser uh, levels of development and higher levels of development. The reason why is because we have a sort of preternatural tendency to dislike hierarchies as a whole, which is a good thing. We should always question power. We should always question hierarchies. Some hierarchies are built in. Development, particularly, is a very interesting one because it starts at zero. Everybody starts at zero. There's no starting at a higher level. You are born with a body and you are born with a brain and that brain gets a certain capabilities. As it says here... Uh, Similar to how Piaget believed that not all people reach the highest level of cognitive development, Kohlberg believed that not everyone progresses to the highest levels of moral development. I would argue that's for a couple reasons. The biggest one being is material conditions. If you don't give people the opportunity to make better choices or teach them how to make better choices, then they don't really ever understand these higher levels of development. You have to provide for them the resources and the ability to move beyond them. If you want to look at it from a Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing, you could say that by giving them all the necessary pieces of a, a previous stage of development, only then can they move on to the next one. So what I want to make clear with this is that, let me see if I can blow this up just a smidgen. And these things continue throughout all stages of life, okay? When we're talking about development, a lot of times we, many people learn like just the, the child-focused stages of development from various um, schools of thought. But this really does go throughout the entire life of a person. No, absolutely. And the problem is, is that this is actually one of the things why I liked integral theory when I came across it was that there is a tendency to believe that people are basically they become adults, right? And then they stop developing. This is not true. People develop throughout the course of their entire lifetime. But most developmental cla development classes talk about this only in regards to childhood, adolescence, and early young adult. And then people just stop. Well, and this is generally how we teach it to people in school anyways, right? Yeah. We don't really teach off that often about the later stages or later, even later age groups of life. One of the things that's really frustrating is that in a lot of developmental tendencies, a lot of times people would assume that their developmental line was the most important. Piaget thought it was cognition. Kohlberg thought it was moral development. Um, Lovinger, Cook writer, thought it was ego development. The thing is, is that if you look at integral theory, one of the things that I like about this, you can't see it very well because our camera's in the way. Let me bop that out of the way. Right here, ignoring these states of consciousness, that's a whole other video. Each of these self, emotional, relational, moral, spiritual, kinesthetic, sexuality, aesthetic, other, cognitive, right? Each of these stages of development by its nature is a different line of development and all of them are happening in you. This is what when, you know, Little Miss Panigal said that we're all multitudes. No, you are literally fucking multitudes. There are different levels of development in you, and not all of them are the highest. The, the highest one tends to be cognition. Not always true, but that generally is the case. Um, um, oh, I was just going to say, just a little fun way to relate some of this back to you is that, especially with queer people, we tend to see a lot of people really develop the sexuality um, and wherever gender fits into that mapping. I'm not entirely sure how integral handles that, but we tend to see a lot of people focus on those areas and go really, really far in those areas, right? That's why we can have such complex discussions about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason why this matters is that what Kohlberg pointed out with with the with this research was that the idea is is that I believe he um, identified it as three stages of development. These are outlined as pre-conventional morality, conventional morality, and post-conventional morality. Just bear with me with this quick little aside. There's a reason why we're getting through it. Stage one is known as obedience and punishment. This is just simple child logic. You follow orders so you don't get hurt. Stage two, individualism and exchange, right? This is where we get into trading, things like that. This is very early, 
You can account this for like, you know, very early times in human history. There was a time where this was cutting fucking edge. Stage two was literally the cutting edge of human development, right? Material conditions allow for this. So you can actually think to yourself, these stages, some of these higher stages didn't exist until the advent of higher technologies, uh, greater levels of, of globalism and connection. They just couldn't. There wasn't a way to do it. Stage three is development, uh, de developing good interpersonal relationships. Stage four is maintaining social order, right? So this is very mm -hmm. much, this stage of conventional morality is often what a lot of conservatives tout, but what they're coming from is pre-conventional. This is why you have to look at this from a lines level, because cognitively speaking, they're coming from convention, they're, 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 they're touting, they're essentially regurgitating conventional morality. But what they're coming from is a stage one obedience punishment. Think about that. Every time you've heard a conservative pundit talk about anything involving morality, what they're often saying is it's about maintaining the social order, going back to tradition, all this other stuff. But what they're really saying is obey me or die. Well, and this is why um, one of the takes that we have is that, uh, especially for like um, inclusivity and diversity, no, you need top down. You need the cases where the government goes, no, it's illegal to discriminate against people for X, Y, Z reason. Because it kind of has to, that's how you have to address that stage. Yeah, and essentially obeying God is the only way to be a good person. Maintaining the social order, yep, that would literally fall into conventional morality. This, I would say, is a very socio to take, Brutus. I think that's actually pretty accurate. So, what was the question? Was well, just saying obeying God is the only way to be a good person, etc. Yeah. yeah. That's what that's saying. Mm -hmm. Stage five, on the other hand, is post-conventional morality, which is social contract and individual rights. Stage six, universal principles. So I want to bring up a, a, a way that this was brought up. People were given a question. I believe this was Kohlberg's. This might have been another moral system, but bear with me. But the question was, okay, you're in a situation where your spouse, let's say your wife, is sick. And not only is she sick, but it's terminal. And there is a life-saving medicine that will save her, but you can't afford it. Like most of the healthcare in the United States, right? What they did is they looked at the aggregate of different people's responses and came to these three conclusions. That is this pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Why this matters is that they really do sort of describe where people are at in their development. And so I'll give you an idea as to what these things do. The people who were at pre-conventional just said they would steal the medicine. Not because of some higher-minded ideal and not because of any larger morality, but because they wanted to. It was beneficial to them. They liked the person in their life and want to keep it, which is not a bad thing. Again, I want to be really clear. No stage of development is bad. Lesser forms of development are only lesser in the sense they, they describe less of reality, but they're still true but partial. This is the thing I like from integral theory is that all stages of development are true but partial. That is, they contain a level of truth but their, their lens is so small in some cases that it is a very partial view of reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is absolutely appropriate. You want your person to live, fuck it. You may either choose not to steal it for fear of some kind of consequence, or you may just do it and go, you know what, this is what I want to do, fuck it. Conventional folks would say they wouldn't steal it because stealing is wrong. From on high, authority has told them, morality speaking, this is wrong. Post-conventional morality... Those people answered and said they would steal the medicine, but their reasoning was entirely different than the pre-conventional folks. Their reasoning was, is that while stealing is wrong, it is a lesser moral issue to steal than it is to let someone die who can be saved. And life as a universal principle, that is a good thing to save, is more important three ways of looking at this one scenario all of them true but true from their level of development so and brutus that i appreciate that that's your view but that doesn't that's not what we're talking about right now so you're in the content we're more in the framework around the content yeah yeah it's i would agree with your 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 your, your view the thing is is that i don't think it's important at the moment because what we're talking about is the the actual thought experiment, which is when we're talking about what makes a good or bad person, what we have to look at is, is where are they coming from and how much does their view affect other people and other things? 
pre-conventional folks have a tendency to think only of themselves. They're egocentric because that's appropriate. A kid from zero to nine is an egocent- is egocentric. It's appropriate. They're basically there to get their needs met. Conventional folks being early, early adolescents to a- adulthood, most people only get to that stage. Things are wrong because either it's wrong to the people I care for, right? The developing of good interpersonal relationships or because authority has said otherwise. And that's appropriate for where they're at. Post-conventional morality says that there are things that are wrong, but what is wrong is going to be entirely contextual on the situation, as given with a stealing example. How this relates to what we were talking about is, is that when you're trying to look at situations of, you know, there being this, this idea of objective morality that a lot of lefties will throw out, what it sounds like they're saying is this. It sounds like they're saying there's universal principles. They're not. They're stating their individual morals are the correct ones in a lot of cases when you actually like really like sort of needle them down into what they're actually trying to say and they're essentially pointing out that this thing is wrong from their mind and often this time tends to come from reactionary thinking now in this case i'm framing reactionary as being essentialist thinking people are either good or bad now if you ask me point blank and you say was stalin a bad person yes stalin was a bad person do I think that's because ontologically Stalin was a bad person? No, I think material conditions led Stalin to make some mm-hmm. really awful things, not to mention probably some severe mental illness. Um, not to be ableist, I'm not saying the mental illness made him a bad person, but I think it probably led to a lot of delusion and a lot of issues. There's this tendency we have to be very gut level when it comes to these things. Young Stalin was ontologically hot. That is true. <laughs> Unironically. Um, but... The thing that I want to try to make people understand is that when I see people come in and they do this really hardcore moralizing, it often they think what they're touting is this very post-conventional level. We'll see this with Lily or with Essence of Thought or other people who are very um, aggressive moralists on the left. And the issue is, is that often what they're actually touting is either they're following the rules as they have been described from from on high, whatever whatever that might be. Or it's literally just obey me. Either follow my will, do what I say, or there will be some sort of punishment. This is where I think a lot of people get lost is that when we're talking about what makes a person good, we kind of have to come at this from a couple levels. And this developmental one is important because in a lot of cases, a developmental one is useful to understand, okay, well, where are they coming from when they're taught, when they're engaging in things? If a person's just acting on their own self-interest with no concern for the rest of the world, they may accidentally do tons of good things, but does that make them a good person? My answer to that would be no. I would say they sort of accidentally fell upward. What is this? Brutus said, I think this is also why a lot of people say that things like people choose to fall down the right rabbit hole as it would be impossible for them to fall no matter what the circumstances. Yeah, because they assume that they, that can happen rather than material conditions, manipulations, and cult-like behavior on the right pulls people in. It's easier to condemn those people as being inherently bad. They must Men must be, like we said in our previous segment, men must be inherently bad. That's why they keep going fascistic. It can't be that the left hasn't really offered them any kind of substitutions of what healthy masculinity looks like or taught them what it means to be a good man or a good person mm-hmm. without reducing them or attacking them. And so the reason why this is important is, is that a lot of people tend to come into our server and they have a tendency to have these very black and white ways of thinking. And the issue with this is, is that often these tend these to the, these very rigid black and white moral lines are usually dripping with tons of exceptions or. Or people flip flop between things or their stuff's not consistent with what they're saying. Yeah. This and then is, arguments look really messy. <laughs> Yeah, it it gets really problematic. And so when we're talking about this, you have these two positions that are essentially incapable of understanding one another because there's a developmental component to them that they don't understand. When someone comes in and says there's a rigid black and white, that should be a clue to you that they're coming from a place in conventional morality. That's not a bad thing. That's not a thing to insult them with or attack with, but it's just a thing to recognize. When you come from a perspective saying, you know, I don't think any person is inherently good or bad. I think that there are things that they can do that may or may not do harm and we can assess those as good or bad and all that. That's a very useful place to come from. But often what people don't realize is that what that comes off to to the person at the lower stage of development 
is it sounds like what you're saying is that morality is just made up and the points don't matter. Because what you don't realize that you're doing is that developmentally speaking, the other person may not be capable of cognitively understanding where you're at. They don't feel that morally. Their morals aren't at a place where they can really conceive of that, even if they cognitively get it, if that makes sense. So when these discussions happen, you have the person who's coming from this very black and white, rigid type of thinking that can set off the other person and trigger them because it feels like they're being attacked. And the other person who is trying to take a much more nuanced perspective, but because they're being unskillful and don't realize how they're, who they are and how they're talking to the other person, come off as almost wishy-washy or unwilling to actually take a position because they're trying to be nuanced, but they're still not willing to go to that level of universal principle, right? Uh, Dr. Ness and, and, and uh, Brutus, leave it. Drop the, to drop the topic. You guys are getting lost. So, so here's the thing. In regards to this, I got into a, ma a, ma a massive argument with my psych professor about the dying spouse thing. She was anti-stealing and I was pro-stealing because a fucking human being is going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because she was developmentally lower than you. Like, I don't mean that to be a bitchy thing, but that's what that means. If, you're, if your issue in that situation is the stealing, that may be developmentally appropriate, but the reality is, is that, let's face it, your values are borked. In that scenario, the life of the person matters. One of the problems that happens, and we talked about this in the integral videos, is that a lot of times these stages of development can't really conceive of the stages beyond them. And often mm -hmm. what happens is, is that they look very similar in, if, you, if you squint. So like the pre-conventional and the post-conventional look very similar. They're both willing to do the stealing. But pre-conventional is willing to do it because it wants to steal or at least thinks that stealing isn't a problem so long as it doesn't get caught. Post-conventional makes the moral judgment that this is appropriate to do because there's a greater value on the line. Those are worlds apart in difference, but superficially, they look similar. Yeah. This is also why the conventional stage of morality looks at them as the same. Essentially, if you're willing to steal to save your wife, whether it's because of selfish reasons like you're just fine stealing, or because you genuinely think there's a higher virtue, because the conventional folks can't conceive of that higher stage of development, spoiler, they just think you're being pre-conventional. They just think you're wanting to do it because you want to do it. It reminds me of the libs and leftist discourse. Well, yeah, because in a lot of cases, ideally, cognitively, liberalism should lead to these universal principles, right? These this social construct and the social contracted individual rights. What it tends to lead to is maintaining social order and also a nesting place for fascism. Um, true, true. So when we come to this thing about morality, what I think is really important to do is to understand that, like, it's not as simple as just what outcomes does that person have? A person who is, again, doing things selfishly and just happens to fail upward, isn't necessarily a good person. They just happen to have done good things, but that streak could end, right? In the same if way- If other circumstances come along and create something else, what would trigger them to make choices, right? Like if you don't have the reasoning down for why you're making those choices, when that streak ends, you might not be making great choices anymore. Yeah. And so the issue is, is that, yeah, when the material conditions change, you might start being a problem hmm. or look at people who have done genuinely bad things. Like you can say they're a bad person if you want to do shorthand. But at the end of the day, what material conditions led them to that outcome? And again, this gets to a really interesting question is, is like if someone is put into a series of material conditions that prevent them from doing well, such as, you know, we've talked about this with with, say, African-Americans, where you know, being in inner city areas with low jobs and um, crime being one of the only ways to make money. And again, uh, Republicans continue to cut governmental programs, which are essentially just, you know, crime insurance. Let's be honest. The essential problem becomes is that a lot of cases, you're basically just forcing people into a situation where they're going to behave in ways that may not necessarily be conventionally moral because they can't if they want to survive. You're putting their basic human needs against their moral judgment. And no offense, your needs win every time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, dude's got the pyramid of needs. Um, Maslow. Yeah. Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of needs. 
Um, ethics are partly a luxury. Yeah, this is where we get into the idea of, like, we talked about before, morally lucky. The idea that some people are just born into circumstances where they are essentially, you know, given these views that lead them to the right outcomes. In the same way, someone can be given a worldview where it leads them to really, really negative outcomes. Does that make them a bad person? Because the problem with this essentialization that I think people are missing is in the same way where there are people who are racist that think that all black people are criminals, in the same way, this idea that somebody is inherently bad because they've done bad things does not open up the possibility they could change and essentially kind of pigeonholes them. This is what a lot of the people flipping out about Lindsay Ellis or ContraPoints or anyone else online have done. They essentially, they, they basically essentialize the person, assume everything about them is negative, and they leave no openness for the possibility that people do make mistakes. Pluvia said, I think Destiny is kind of a perfect example of this, which is why it, it takes her a total crapshoot. Yeah, I genuinely think Destiny is the type of person who kind of failed upwards as far as you know, had a, was a libertarian, came up with some somewhat progressive views, and then when it was no longer advantageous to do so, has been basically, you know, melting every single one of those views um, at any given point, right? Mm -hmm. Pathologic is a great game to demonstrate this, to be honest. The material conditions force you to make tough decisions. No, no, Pathologic, from what I've seen, both one and two do some really great jobs about that. This is the thing, is that I'm not trying to say that we don't get to assess people as being bad. I'm just saying is that to some degree... It's not necessarily a thing in all cases, because often, because of this tendency to essentialize, we can lead to really negative outcomes. Like, for example, again, the people who are very anti certain types of media and have some good reasons for being anti those types of media also tend to be people who are against things like kink. And they justify it as saying, in some cases, this is a lot of second wave feminism, that these things are equal, like certain types of, like, say, um, staged. CNC pornography, things like that. This leads to these negative outcomes, but that's really questionable by the research. So the, qu the, the issue becomes is, is someone who likes that type of kink or type of thing a bad person? No, because they're not really doing any harm in, the, um, harm in the world. Now, if they go out and actually do something non-consensual, that is a bad thing. But having an interest in a, yeah, do not show feet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but as far as engaging with something that some people might consider problematic. Yeah. Ghostly Blurry Face says CNC is a touchy, touchy subject. Yeah, I don't think it should be. It's very simplistic, honestly. It's not even a nuanced thing. As long as there are proper safety precautions in regards to si the situation and everybody's up on them and you have clear precautions, it's not a problem. The only issue it becomes is it makes other people uncomfortable. So when we say CNC, by the way, consent, non consent, um, it involves uh, consent given to a situation that is a, a role play or a, um, a a scenario where people are acting in a situation um, that is a uh, um, not a not an actual like assault or rape or something like that, but is uh, just an an act of um, a pretend act of of a non-consensual situation, okay? So this could be, like, kidnap scenarios or something weird like that, too. Um, it's not even all bad or anything like that. But again, with the thing to recognize is that consent is still at the start here. That's still there, okay? The ethical and the way to do these situations are still to make sure that there is always choice all the way throughout the thing, and that is the major part that separates it from actual assault and rape is that there is still, you know, a choice in how and what is engaged in. And so the thing is, is that when we're talking about these types of things, my problem with essentialization as a tactic mm -hmm. is that when you engage in it, I honestly think essentialization, to come back over to the map, just to show you, essentialization is really just these lower stages. In order for you to come to this, come to the conclusion that a person is such a way or not is is basically just doing this much lower form of development uh, as far as morality or as far as perspective of the person. And the issue with I have with this is that by definition, this tendency to allow ourselves to essentialize starts to become habitual. Mm -hmm. So this is where I want to reframe things on you. I actually think the definition between a good and bad person is not just looking and weighing out the outcomes of their actions. 
but the intention behind their actions, as well as their tendency to engage in essentialization. Because when people willy-nilly engage in essentialization, they seem to lead to negative outcomes, even if occasionally those essentializations lead to positive ones. I just think that's accidental. And so you get into this problem where when you're talking about morality, this reactionary tendency to essentialize people, to make them a particular way of being. Yeah, it's the broken clock thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not reliable modes of analysis because they come out with bad outcomes often when we essentialize people. This is like the canceling video for Contra, where again, this notion of people sort of take a thing, they abstract it, and then they essentialize it, right? That stuff gets really problematic because there's many cases where it doesn't mean anything. Again, I, I point you towards Sarah Zed's um, the Panopticon video because that's literally what happens. People took the essentializations of a guy who wasn't a particularly great date and turned him into the most abusive, terrible person ever. Oh, it wasn't even a great... Oh, there was that guy, but there was another guy in the video who just, like, was surprised by his girlfriend and, like... Because he didn't have, because she didn't have the right reaction. Everyone thought she was cheating or she was like a sociopath. Oh, no, they projected that onto him because he didn't look like excited enough to a lot of people. Oh, that's right. She came to see him. That's right. Yeah. But like, we have no idea what any of the um, context around that situation was or what he was going through at the time. Like, fuck, could, dude could have had a headache, right? Like, we don't know. Well, it's like the true crime people on TikTok, right? Like, they get in this thing where like, there's like that situation right now with that psychic who like basically said that like she knew who the killer was in the situ in this crime situation. And then like when it turned out to be someone else, she just doubled down on it. But yeah, I, I want to be really clear that like there's no way we can always have all context for all situations. And I'm not saying you shouldn't use tools existing on, you know, websites that have a TOS. If someone's bothering you, I'm not asking you not to block them or not to get rid of them or just troll them with a funny picture. Fesh's point about using that picture with the, you know, the ontological evil thing just to fuck with them. Fine, do it. What I'm saying is, is that in your own psychology, your own way of thinking, you have to work, you have to watch out for this tendency of essentialization because it will often lead you to negative outcomes. You will miss something. You can assume that person's an asshole. You can assume they're having a bad day. You can assume that you just had a bad interaction with them. I don't care. All I am trying to point out is, is that the essential tendency, this, this essentializing tendency is where you get into problems. It's when people use their feel feels to start interpreting data. Like we saw in the previous segment about men. Yeah, men are more likely to commit, you know, certain types of sexual crimes. There are reasons for that, but these people don't care. They just essentialize men as being predators. It can't be that Finster likes wearing girls clothes and, and is an ally to the trans mm -hmm. community. It must be this is a grift, right? It's essentialization. And it often arises out of taking real or at least supposed real data combined with people's upset or offense or their way of dealing with things and coming out to some really dumb outcomes. So when we're asking what makes a good or bad person, I would actually ask the question is, is okay, what are their outcomes of their actions? How do they arrive at those actions? And what specifically are their actions in regards to how are they engaging with them? I'm not going to say pre-conventional morality isn't a type of morality. It is. But it does come out to a lot of bad outcomes. Because you can selfishly justify. The same person that could justify stealing the medicine because they want the medicine could also justify letting their wife die because they don't want to be married anymore. It's the same egocentricism, it's just different outcome. Does that make sense? Are you guys getting this? This is a reoccurring thing that comes up with all sorts of discussions. We talked about it with the CNC thing. There's the whole discussion around... Um, Heck, somebody got into traffic laws with this stuff, okay? One person was arguing from like a very like pre-conventional stage. Somebody else came into that conversation arguing from the conventional side, and someone else was in there arguing from somewhere in the post-conventional side, and no one had any idea what the fuck was going on. It was one of the, the strangest conversations I think I've seen on the server. Yeah. Okay. And, and traffic laws. Well, and it get, and again, when you get into these really hard things, like there is, there are things like we've talked about this with the old man laundry video. We've talked about the idea of non-offending pedophiles. We've talked about 
Um, we've talked about this with CNC. We've talked about those last things. These are complicated topics, how they affect society, how they deal with things. Mm -hmm. But people have these gut reactions and want to essentialize and say this. For every person who is, you know, a terrible rapist or some, you know, active pedophile, there are people in the world who are non-acting and resisting those urges or people who are interested in CNC and are not in any way harming anybody. They just have a kink. Mm hmm. Or they've used a trusted relationship with their partner to heal trauma. Like Yeah, like, for example, with, uh, what is it, DDLG, right? There's people mm -hmm. who will get into those relationships. Yeah, sometimes it's sexual and they're working out some shit. But other times it might be they just want to be a little because being able to play with toys and shit sounds like fun. And being able to have the relationships they either never had with parents previously or um, to get back the child that they lost in the case of a trans person is perfectly acceptable. CNC can trip up people whose moral framework is largely vibes based, but that's the problem with vibes is can we just call it what it is? It's not even vibes. It's just bias. It's emotional squick. I'm going to make fun of it again. It's Shu. Shu thinks everything is pedophilic. Everything. It's all just pedophilic. And the problem isn't in her mind is that it's always based on the ick factor. Everything is based on whatever make her feel, it makes her feel uncomfortable. She occasionally gets hits, but more often than not, she misses a lot. Yeah, it's just, it's again, it's vibes. I feel vibed why that this is, must be this thing. And so I act out. Yeah, it's feelings over facts, like legitimately. Oh, wait, social say explain. Are you talking about like zero or one, either or on off kind of thing? CNC is a type of kink known as consent, non-consent. It is essentially simulating non-consent situations in a consensual manner. Yeah, that was way more concise than what I said earlier. Correct. And hell, I'll just be really clear with you guys. I am consensual with all of my partners, 100%. You can ask any of them, even the ones that hate me. Now that's bare minimum, but let me be really clear about this. I engage in ERP a lot, and some of those ERPs are either dubious consent in regards to the Omegaverse stuff, because again, in the Omegaverse, um, hormones kind of push you to be a certain way, and technically your consent is not fully legitimate, or some of them, that is not, wait, I don't know how they you got went there. off the rails. Yeah, that one. That, but, or uh, erotic role play, you know, typing back and forth, fun shit like that. Basically writing really sexy stories. Um, or some of it's just outright, you know, gets into non-consent stuff. And the thing is, that's my fucking business. And the business of the people I do that with. They're people that I trust. They're people I care about. They're playmates. They're friends. And so to me, does that, and does me engaging in that stuff make me a bad person? Am I actively engaging in some kind of harm in the world because I have those kinks or because I'm working some shit out? If I weigh myself as a person and say, what do I do in the world? Okay, I work as a therapist. I actively try to people help people work through their shit and actually try to like themselves better and work for them to actually like be their true self. Does that make me a good person? Not necessarily. I could come into this profession and be an idiot. There are tons of them. Trust me, I've met them at trainings. <laughs> Zena's heard me complain about them a lot. When clinicians are like, I don't know what that trans lifestyle is. Yeah, yeah. That's just, a, it's just you know, when you have an alternative lifestyle. Um, <laughs> well, what? <laughs> Yeah, this is, I'm doing this intentionally. I just was one day like, man, I'm going to take a fuck ton of hormones uh, just for, just for shits and giggles. Yeah, like that's the thing is there are people that can be clinicians. There are people that can be therapists that have bad morals. Like again, I've said before, I don't think clinicians can be conservative because our ethics go against them. But there are people that are. Oh, I've heard some dumb takes from like my bosses that have worked with like at risk youth who are like, no, don't make connections with the kids. Don't share anything about themselves. You can't tell them that you have a similar interest in like board games or music you're not allowed to say that i've heard that stuff too like does that make a good person despite this person being at a job where they help kids the problem is is that at the end of the day this is one of the big questions we're always asking this is why ableism racism transphobia all of these things have have essentializing qualities in them because essentially they ask the question if you're trans does that make you a bad person if you're someone who's disabled does that make you a bad person if you're someone who's of another race does that make you a bad person and the answers to these are are absolutely 100% demonstrably no. But this is what essentializations lead to. Essentially, most prejudice is just essentializing. This is why on this channel, we try to take as much of a deep take on things as hu as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about things, whether it's certain types of kink or certain types of situations or how to deal with things on a systemic level, 
what we're trying to do is look at things as deeply as possible so that we're trying to get to the best possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this involves looking at the situations from multiple different views. Yeah, and that's the issue is, is that a lot of times people go for their gut. Like someone said in chat earlier, it's vibes based and they just react to it. That's what Shu does. That's what Laundry did. Laundry doesn't know shit about fucking anime, but went off on a giant bug because didn't care. And well, there are problems with anime, not going to argue that. He centralized an entire genre. Genre, like, and cultural Rather than a problem in genre. that genre. Yeah. As one thing, yeah. So again, the thing I guess we're trying to get to is that to be a good person means not only trying to do good things in the world. And we're not saying everybody has to do it all the time perfectly. We all fuck up. And we're also not saying outcomes are the only thing that matter because intentionality matters too. It's good if you fuck up and do something great. It's better if you meant to do it. It says more about you as a person. We can all agree to that. Well, and this is where we get into manslaughter versus murder, right? Yeah. An accidental something broke in your car and you hit somebody and they died. That's not the same thing as you intentionally drove into somebody on the street. Like, yeah, dri- get, dri- very you know, different. Driving onto your, you know, driving onto, driving on the sidewalk and hitting an entire kindergarten class, right? Like the 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 difference of what was your intention in that situation, and again. How do you deal with essentialization? Because I found that the people that I would code as bad people tend to be lower developmentally as far as Kohlberg would be concerned and tend to essentialize more. It also means that if you're in a higher stage of development as far as as far as morals and, and the like, you have to understand that not everyone gets to higher stages because material conditions, life experience and the set and, the, and, and more all to some degree, lead to people only getting so far. And you're absolutely right, social psych explainer. It's also more sensitive to feelings of disgust, like I've talked about before multiple times. The psychology Mm -hmm. of prejudice outlines that people who are more sensitive to the emotion of disgust are more likely to be conservatives. They're also more likely to be developmentally down here. Well, and to bring it back to what you were saying at the beginning as well, um, the other thing to keep in mind is that in order to move through these, you really do need to have knowledge that keeps building on these stages right and so if you're trying to get somebody who's really not able to understand to understand something much much higher you're going to run into some massive problems there Mm -hmm. no absolutely and why are we talking about this the reason is is that there's now been like two or three different scenarios on our discord server where this stuff has come up because we have people who are very passionate about certain topics they post articles they post things And don't get me wrong, I love these people, they're great, they're wonderful. But the reason why we want to talk about them partially is because they're making the same error the people they're arguing with are. In a lot of cases with these situations, you have two people who have been traumatized, one of them who comes to very rigid positions because their trauma has forced them to, and a lot of people whose trauma essentially leads them to being afraid of any kind of rigidity Mm -hmm. because the rigidity is what was traumatizing to them. Rigid parents, rigid moral structures, whatever. The purpose of this was to kind of get into an abstract and discuss this more effectively, because in a lot of questions, this is a thing. Um, well, in a lot of times, I think these are the conversations that I don't... When I see these, this kind of thing going on in the background of a conversation, these are usually why there isn't much of a resolution. Like, the people don't really ever come to agreement. They just kind of go until somebody calls it. Um... And that's because there isn't really a great way to, like, make that bridge all the time. Especially not, like, in the in the heated moment of a discord. <laughs> yeah. Um, Divine? Uh, div- divine? Yeah. Asked, um, okay, question. How do you reach a person whose moral development is lower than yours? That is a fantastic question. Here's the outline. One of the things I'm very concerned about it, a lot of times in our discussions is that we do not code our discussions to the place where the person's at. You need to meet people where they're at. We just talked about that with the masculinity discussion. Mm -hmm. You need to meet people where they're at. There are a bunch of men in the world who don't have friends, don't have lovers, don't have anything. And you can say, oh, fuck them. But that really doesn't address the problem. It makes them susceptible to cult-like tactics from the right. So the issue is, is that what do you do when you're dealing with someone who's at a stage of development that appears to be lower than yours? Because you can't really know. You're not giving them a developmental test in the moment. The best thing you can do is try to frame the moral dilemma, whatever it might be, through their values. Yep. So in the case of the person seems like they're coming from pre-conventional, you want to f- phrase that in some way that is going to be 
let's say, beneficial to them at a self level. If the person's coming in from a conventional place, then you're probably going to want to have them, um, you're going to want to talk about it from either this authority said this, or to some degree, this is what helps maintain status order, or to some degree that this is a, this is beneficial to the whole. These are things that you have to kind of outline in their worldview. In fact, one of the things I would say developmentally is that, and this is where integral kind of comes in, and I'll show you this real quick. Again, I have my issues with integral theory, but bear with me. The way that Wilbur Coe did this, and you don't have to know this stuff, just follow me. These different colors are basically just stages of development. Kohlberg's development would basically fall to, this is pre-conventional, this is conventional, this is post-conventional. You'll notice there are stages up here. Wilbur's argument was that when you'd hit the stage beyond that, we can call that for the purposes of this discussion, post-post-conventional morality. The idea being is that you essentially need to get to a place where you are developmentally aware that other people exist in other developments and that they exist in all of these different worldviews. These aren't just stages of development. They're discrete worldviews. For the person at pre-conventional, they literally live in that world. For the person who's at conventional, they literally live in a conventional world. They could not understand it differently than that. And so when you hit a certain stage of development, what happens is, is you get the ability to recognize that these are not only stages that exist in most people, they exist in you. All of the people listening to this have gone through certain stages. All of you went through egocentric, sort of sociocentric behaviors. Some of you got past that. Some of you are post-conventional. Some of you are conventional. Some of you may be beyond that. The point being is, is that when you start to recognize that people function as, as different lines or stages of development, you get to this place where you recognize that those things exist in you and you can find those places in you and use them as a way to find that discussion point. Because the issue that comes down to it is, is that when you're trying to talk to somebody at pre-conventional or conventional or post-conventional, you need to speak at their level. This is where the people I was talking about earlier on the other side of this debate, while I agree with them in principle, their behavior sucks because what often comes down to it is, is they're so rigidly against any kind of moralizing that they sound either like they're, they're waffling or, and here's where it gets really complicated. This is where a post post conventional view takes on. They don't realize that they're doing the same thing. The previous level is they may think they're engaging in a universal principle, but what they're really doing is just kind of dealing with their own reactionary tendency and then kind of, teasing it out to a universal principle. They're actually still creating a hierarchy. My view on this is above other people's. The view that there isn't any good or evil is beyond is in and of itself good. You're still creating that value. Do you see that? It's recursive at that point. That's my problem with it, is that at some point it becomes an issue where when you start to say no perspective is inherently good or evil, and that's the right perspective, that's contradicting as fuck. So what you're saying is we're better than most people. Well, no, development doesn't mean you're necessarily a good person. There are like there are people who are developmentally sophisticated and awful. Hannibal Lecter would be a great example of someone who's incredibly cognitively sophisticated and is an awful human being. Well, um, and the other thing to recognize too is that it is very easy for um especially on the left for a lot of people to to be in drastically different places in different lines of development. Okay, it, that part of the chart here, and I, I also, I think this is where we get, oh, it's someone behind us, damn it. Um, I think especially on the left, we get really lost because some of us um, are really, really good at certain lines, okay? And may have not, uh, and may not, you know, have developed on other lines. Right? And it's really, really hard to navigate those situations. You might be able to have some really deep, intense conversations about queer topics with somebody, but not, um, but, you know, some other topic about traffic lights. No, that conversation might go just up in flames. Well, and I guess the thing I'll, I'll kind of put on this as well is that I think Sina's got a point. I also want to add to the idea that, like, mm -hmm. and we don't have to go on this much longer. I just wanted to make sure people are aware of it is that one of the things you have to realize is that, you know, there's these debates on the on the left about, like, do pulling people over from reactionaries work, you know, do, do debates work? And the answer is, is, like, diversity of tactics is a thing. 
But there's a reason why these things work with certain people and don't with others. Yep. There are some people who are developmentally sophisticated, but have a direct self-serving need to keep certain negative things going. Fuck, Karl Rove, part of the Bush administration, was aware of these developmental tendencies. He read and was a big fan of Spiral Dynamics, which is um, values development by Claire, by Claire Grave. Like, the enemy uses this shit. Why aren't we? Mm-hmm. And so the problem is, is that when you understand these developmental systems, when you understand like kind of like a base view, you, yeah, there's a reason why, because he understood what, how to speak to different groups. The issue comes down to it is, is that when you're trying to make an assessment about these things, you have to take on these views because you have to understand that different people are having different experiences. The reason why some people will see a debate and they'll move over to the left is numerous, but it can be really comes down to just a simple developmental issue. If you hit them at the right time with the right argument, you may be able to developmentally shift them to understand a new way of thinking. Imagine shifting someone from pre-conventional to conventional. Yeah, their version of conventional might be like post-conventional values, but who cares? They're regurgitating ones that we need them to regurgitate. Or it could be them shifting from conventional to post-conventional, them actually trying to hold greater values. People are not lost until they've decided they're lost or until we decide not to actually pursue that. There's a reason why these things work with some people and some people and, and not. Some people are just genuinely like manipulated into certain situations. There's ways to pull them out. You speak to them at their level. And this is true with your families too. If you have family members that are conservative or whatnot, try to speak at their level instead of coming off as like the overly educated fucking leftist who wants to argue every damn thing. Either drop the topics at holidays so you can actually enjoy yourself or... If you really have to have these arguments, talk to them at their level. Find out what needs they're trying to get met. You'll either figure out really quickly that they're either bad faith, in which case, fuck it, or that you might actually come to some understanding. You may not move them to your level or your position, but you might move them closer. Absolutely. Or get them the framework to start heading in that direction towards you. Um, I think that that particular question of what is the person needing or what are they trying to get out of the situation is a really big one that's really really helpful yeah um when i deal with like parents of queer kids i try to figure out the same thing like in that conversation okay where is this person out where are they coming from you know and that that's where i try to address them wherever they're at i try to use language that they would recognize i try to break it down in ways that they can recognize Am I going to use, like, tomboy to describe something to, like, a queer teen nowadays? No. they That's not really in common usage anymore. But the parent whose kid is, is gender diverse, can I start going, hey, you know what? The thing is, is that, you know, I know from youth, you know, tomboys were more of a thing. This stuff tends to go a lot deeper than that, but it is similar where, you know, people are breaking out of the mold, and that's okay. You know what? I got that parent way more on board and way more comfy with hearing their kid after that. That's a positive. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, what do you think of Vosh's I'm right because I'm right and I think you're wrong? I mean, at the core level, emotionally, that's true. Like, I'll just say that. That's true. The reason why, like, at the end of the day, every time you're engaging with someone in any kind of debate or argument, the answer comes down to, I, I'm right because I think I'm right and I think you're wrong. Now, then you have to actually de demonstrate that. You actually have to show that. Um, anyone who says otherwise, I think, is being disingenuous because at the end of the day, like, well, unless, yeah, well, they're either being disingenuous or a grifter, right? There may be some other, other thing in the system that is causing them to behave or state a position they don't actually have or to state a falsehood. This happens all the time with people like Candace Owens mm -hmm. and like who just lie out, you know, lie like they breathe. This worked with my dad and getting him to understand my schizophrenia. Yeah, you talk to people where they're at. Mm -hmm. This is why I really disliked the whole, like, academia has been talking about how to deal with men for the last 30 years. Yeah, and it's failed miserably. Well, you guys have been sitting in your ivory tower talking shit. You actually haven't been doing anything. I love academia. Don't get me wrong. I love being in that sphere. It's fun as shit. But does it have problems? Yeah. A lot of problems. And the issue is, is that, like, yeah, you can be super educated on this stuff, but that doesn't on the ground fix these issues. How would you figure out where you are yourself uh, in your types of things like moral conventions or on the chart kind of? So honestly, the thing I would say is you would look into developmental testing. I went and got tested back in like 2010 
uh, by Susan Cook Reuter in her ego development system, which I may go over on stream at some point because I find it to be a fascinating system. Um, but basically, long story short, is that um, she had a thing where you could, for $300, take the test and just see where you came out. And it was basically assessed by her, a graduate student, and then they ran it through a battery that would like assess it. So they would try to get it as accurate as possible with three different scoring. I'll get back to that in a second. Jay Rogers, what I'll say to that is, it works with your dad with schizophrenia because your dad may have a genuine desire to help you, and you're working off of that. The reason why it doesn't work with your mom and understanding generational trauma is she has an incentive to not acknowledge that trauma, especially if she helped engage in it. Or if um, she has her own trauma in there as well. Absolutely. Her own trauma may make it difficult for her to acknowledge that because people bury shit or they ignore it or they pretend it wasn't that bad or any number of things. Um, but when I got tested at that, and again, this is going to sound so fucking egotistical. And I don't mean it to be. I just, this is where it was. In ego development, when I got tested, at least as far as Cook Reuter's system, I was about here. I'll zoom in for you. Um, magician, construct aware, five to six perspectives, deep processes, rule principles, fifth person perspective, cross historical, global view, interplay of awareness, action, thought, and feeling and body, focuses on conscious awareness and transformation, aware of self as storied, a fiction, or ongoingly created. I'd say I'm probably still there ish. Now, my cognition depends on what we're talking about other lines you it's hit or miss part of the problem with this this, this situation is each of these systems is only testing a specific line so the problem is is that you would only get an, in, an, an understanding of where that line would be as long as the testing was trustworthy so the problem is is that like with this one i trust the testing because i was literally one of the people that helped create it um along with lovinger now does that mean i'm better or you know more sophisticated than other people not by not by a, a long shot the un honest problem with it is is that as i said at the time when i got the testing results um yeah um yeah dating is going to be hard uh uh because <laughs> most people don't there are needs that i have that a lot of people don't meet um, and it's, it's hard to describe some of those needs because those needs can be very abstracted. Yeah. How would you get tested or look into this? I would say the best way to do it is in a very light handed way, check out things like spiral dynamics. Um, you can download the ego development stuff from Susan Cook writer's website. You can look into, uh, Kohlberg or any of the other developmental psych de developmental theorists. And what I would say is just see where you resonate and what makes sense with you and then hold that in a very light hand. Mm -hmm. Don't rigidly wield it as a cudgel where you think you're better than other people, but use it as a way to kind of gauge, okay, if I really am at this place, how do I communicate those values or those things to other people at other stages? You're doing it as a way to understand positioning, not as a way to hold power over people. Does that make sense, uh, Adrian? If you work with youth too, especially the stuff comes really in handy. Yeah, you can see this in youth, especially with like teenagers because you can watch them develop um yeah you can watch them go through um a lot of this, um as you watch like youth in general develop a lot of these things are pretty cool. um big differences you know from age to age cook rooter is k or was it a uh, c-o-o-k dash um or hyphen um g-e g-r-e-u-t-e-r -E -E i think it's german um but if you look you can find the updated version of the nine um what is it what is it called the uh nine levels of awareness there should be an updated version of it or just look up uh cook reuter nine levels of awareness you might find it through there that one goes into perspectives uh the number of perspectives a person can hold um essentially it's like think about writing and the way in which we do like first person second person third person it goes on to then look at fourth person fifth person etc where you're sort of taking on larger and larger perspectives of yourself um very useful stuff what movie is it um the one with the what's it called the girl that moves with the emotions in her head oh uh, in um uh, inside inside out yeah inside out that's an interesting one for development too exploring yeah. like emotional development that's no an that's interesting super fair yeah so if you want a fun movie but um, yeah, we can talk more about this. I, I highly recommend you guys go check out the developmental videos and the integral videos. I know they're very abstract and I know they, they, they aren't everyone's cup of tea, but it'd be nice if those videos actually got some views. 
but also just because I think that they give a better idea of this. Um, so yeah, the the knowledge for for development as a whole really does take a lot of learning and understanding. It's something like if you have access to online courses or college courses or something of that nature, by all means, go do it. I also want to be really clear that despite the fact that I like Wilbur's map, Ken Wilbur's map of Aquil, um, that doesn't mean I, I wholesale like sign off on a lot of his other choices, including like allowing views of teachers. Um, when people called him out on certain behaviors, he kind of just mm, acted like an idiot. This isn't a wholesale uh, like endorsement of Ken Wilbur, only the fact that I like his map because I think it leads to greater outcomes of thinking. Um, so yeah, just want to make that very clear. But again, how we outline goodness on the channel would be outcomes, intentions, and to what degree are we essentializing something? Yep. What lens of analysis are we using and how sophisticated is that lens of analysis? That's important because rather than just sort of blanket coat people as good or bad, it's probably a really better idea to try to Yes, have firm boundaries online. Yes, still block people. Yes, still do all that stuff. But when we're talking about people in our personal lives, you have to make very, very nuanced discussion decisions about mm -hmm. how you want to interact with and who you want to interact with. So, yeah. Well, and even on your online discussions, at some point coming into this going, you know what, this is just a single snapshot that I have of the situation, right? So that with that said, um, yeah. unless we have anything else, I think that's good. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that said, um, yeah, uh, we're going to end this segment here. And uh, we're obviously going to continue stream for a little bit. But um, with that said, uh, we will see you guys in the next one. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, consider donating to us. You can support us on our website, transgirltherapist.org. You can also help us on our Patreon, link below. Or you can become a member here on YouTube. Um, thank you so much for watching.